recording. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Harlan Hoken with GSP and we're going to have an interesting discussion about border and migrant issues with people uh, from our church who are very deeply involved in such matters. We've got Del McCormick and Marjorie King and Valerie James and um, they're going to talk about what they know, what they've experienced, and have a little conversation about uh, uh, these matters and what they've done, what they can do, and maybe what we can do. And um, we'll have another conversation later and find out what the progress has been, if any, <laughs> and get another report later. So take it away. Marge is gonna go first, right? I'll go first because yeah. the missing people here are, of course, Deacon Nancy and Steve Maddox. Deacon Nancy has been working since long before I started attending this church. She's been working on border issues. And she's the one who started our vigil. Every two weeks we have a vigil. Migrants are very, as they tend to be very religious and they deeply feel the power of prayer. And so our every two week vigil does help them. They know we're praying for them, many of the people who are detained in Eloy. Uh, it also is very good for us as activists because this can be work that's quite discouraging. So um, we feel uplifted by this vigil every two weeks. I also want to mention Steve Maddox, who took the bull by the horns when we needed somebody to start our radical hospitality, otherwise known as sanctuary when we first invited a family to, to live in our protective, under our protective roof. Uh, and while I'm at it, I think most of you have seen that we do pray for individuals and we collectively pray every Sunday for the men and women detained in Eloy. Uh, we've recently attended some protests, hoping to pressure the private prisons and the government to release these people who've committed no crime other than crossing the border, seeking asylum. Uh, there have been more COVID out, uh, tests positive in Eloy than any but three other of the migration, shel not shelters, excuse me, detention centers. To migrate and seek asylum should not be a death sentence. Uh, you may have seen the letter by 15 clergy recently in the Arizona Daily Star. The migrant ministry pushed for that letter and we are so grateful to our father, Steve, for spearheading that among his peers. Uh, the only other thing that I think I want to say is that for ourselves, we have started a book group. We need to learn more and we want to share our understanding with you through our projects and all are welcome to join any of the activities of the Migrant Ministry. The book we have just finished is by Miguel de la Torre and it's called Immigration. It's based in Tucson in Southern Arizona. Uh, the reason I picked this slender but powerful volume is because it discusses in a very clear way the origins and roots of, my, of um, the migration as it has swelled over the past few, few years. So I would really like to call on Reverend Del McCormick to talk more about the structural causes of migration at this point. And Del, will you give a little self-introduction? You're the newest member of our migrant ministry and we're so glad to have you. Um, and I just completed my doctorate uh, in 2018 on being church in the borderlands because this has been my ministry for the 25 years that I was ordained, um, either in a local church setting or uh, as the executive director of Borderlinks and another um, retreat center where we did 
education and advocacy around immigration, raising awareness and inspiring action uh, of people of faith and people who didn't identify as faith-based. Um, so part of my work was to live and work in Mexico for eight years and I got to experience firsthand the changes that came about the free trade agreement, um, the first free trade agreement between Mexico, US and Canada uh, came about on uh, January 1st, 1994. And that was touted as something that would bring Mexico along and bring, uh, bring it into a developed country and would benefit all the people and the trickle down theory that it would get to the poorest of the poor. But the way that it was rolled out was um, absolutely um, such that it benefited the people who are already wealthy and impoverished people who were already poor. This right? is news. So, uh, that's right. Um, yeah. And there was, a, there was a Zapatista National uh, Liberation Army uprising the exact same day that NAFTA went into effect for an indigenous civil rights movement to protest the free trade agreement because the, there was a knowledge. And at the very same time, I think it was uh, Operation Hold the Line or Operation Gatekeeper, that they started to batten down the hatches on the border because they knew that there would be a flood of, of, of uh, immigrants, refugees, economic refugees from Mexico. Uh, when was that? Uh, can you give us a date? January, time? January 1st, 1994. Oh, ooh, it's been a while. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so and, and almost immediately it started up to 500,000 a year, this, this hemorrhage from Mexico and from Central American countries that were adversely affected. At the same time, a, a plan went into effect called the Plan Puebla Panama, or the Plan Mesoamerica, and it went from Puebla in the central Mexico all the way down to Panama, supposedly for development. And, but it was development that uh, created um, highways that were quotas, so only people who could afford to work, drive on them could drive on them. It was mainly to deliver goods from the south to the north. Uh, it was around exploiting resources, the natural resources of um, Chiapas particularly has a lot of water and supplies a lot of the hydroelectric power for the United States. Um, and the creation of dams and the whole infrastructure of, of internet infrastructure so that business could do their business properly. Um, and immediately along with that, in order to have, in order to be able to sign the free trade agreement, um, Mexico had to sign into law a change, a dramatic change in their law about the holding of land by indigenous peoples. They're called ejido lands. And they had to sign a law saying that indigenous people could then sell parcels of their ejido lands which meant that large parcels of land could be eaten up bit by bit by large agribusiness as the indigenous people were moved off of their land because if they had a hospital bill or just the smallest thing would force them to sell their land and that way a lot of really incredibly valuable land human resources and natural resources were have been exploited through that process so it's been at not even a slow erosion almost immediately we saw the effects of globalization, the Sam's Club, the Costco, the McDonald's, the uh, things more in English, um, and the small mom and pop, um, the farmer's market kind of, mercado kind of places, um, the little businesses went, went belly up almost right away. There was absolutely no way, and there were no, the money was put into creating a beautiful setting and a place that, that there could be movement of goods and people, but there was no money put into the infrastructure of healthcare or education or the things that people needed to pull themselves out of poverty. Um, at the same time, the cartel started gaining power and many of the gangs that started in the U.S., who'd been members who'd been deported to the, to the South, to Mexico and Central America, gained a very, very strong foothold. So at the same time, not just the violence of poverty, but the violence of gang violence and cartel violence escalated incredibly. So I saw, at first the husband would come to the United States and the goal was to come back and they could come back and forth very easily. Um, it was still illegal for them to enter the United States, but it was easier for them to do so. As soon as the free trade, trade agreement went into effect, it was, it was a felony if you crossed the border and you were caught. And so therefore, if the second time you came across, then you would be incarcerated or detained. And so people stopped risking trying to come home and stayed in the U.S. for longer periods of time. Um, men who went to the United States who were married 
found another woman, they left their wives, they were killed in accidents because their jobs are very dangerous. And so then the, then the moms would come from the family and the grandmother would have the whole family taking care of them, which was an incredibly untenable situation. Um, and then we saw the kids started to come, that kids as young as six or seven years old started to come unaccompanied uh, or come maybe with a 10 year old sibling um, to, to be with their parents in the United States. So all the while it got more and more dangerous. While we were not only creating a wall to keep people out, we created a virtual wall of millions and millions of dollars of towers and motion detectors and um, lights and infrared lights so that we could see whether, whether people were crossing in the dark. So it became extremely dangerous and difficult for people. And they began moving farther out into the desert and more perilous areas to cross. And so we saw more deaths. So you have that kind of situation and, and add to that that it's extremely difficult to get a visa to come to the United States. We can go into Mexico and we get a six month visa very easily to be, go into Mexico. And we can go into Mexico and only 75 miles to then you have to get a visa to go into it. But um, Mexicans have to have a visa to step foot in the United States. They have to go to US embassy. They have to call on a line that's like a dollar a minute for them to call, hold on in the line, get themselves to Mexico City or to an embassy where they can where they can apply for a visa, where they're often turned down. They have to have bank accounts. They have to have the equivalent of IRS statements, et cetera. So the poorest of the poor who don't even have birth certificates because it costs money to get a birth certificate have no access to come across legally. And even we've seen college professors, people who did have a home and did have jobs, if they were deemed high risk for staying in the United States, they were not given a visa and they would end up walking. And we've had people like that who died. One of the spouse, spouses died crossing. So um, that situation has got increasingly untenable as we have exploited the resources in that area. And as I said, the Plan Puebla Panama went all the way down to Panama. So then the whole Northern Triangle where we're seeing people from Guatemala, El Salvador, um, Honduras, Nicaragua, coming even even more farther south and now it's ecuador and brazil and cuba and haiti and so many countries where there's economic collapse because of the exploitation of human and natural resources in order to make the rich richer it also makes the poor poorer and so there's absolutely no exit and i'm telling you it doesn't matter what kind of wall you build how many layers there are to it people will continue to to cross so I just wanted to give a little bit of background about why people come. Most of them these days don't want to come. It's not, it's not safe for them to come to the U.S. They have no protection under the law, and, um, but they have no other way to feed their children, no other way to survive. Can, can I ask uh, what the situation is today as far as people coming, uh, given the virus situation and the, uh, uh, you know, Difficulty so crossing, and I mean, are Americans going into Mexico, or any Mexicans coming into the states? So. Yeah, yeah, there's still some tourism happening in in Mexico, and you know, I understand that in certain ports of entry, you have to have your temperature taken and and um, so forth. But um, they need the you know the dentists need the doctors need the business, and the and the uh, resorts need the business. So the wealthier Americans, yes, are going. Um, they're, they're stopping. I mean, we have not been able to go as border support. We, we would cross the border. Um, the, the, um, we, the GSP helps support a shelter in Nogales and, um, nobody's been able to cross back. Or forth. Nogales, Sonora. Nogales, Sonora. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it used to be called Las Torres and now it's called Casa de Misericordia. So they've been in, most of them have been in quarantine and they, they have people that are locked down because they can't go home because the borders are closed to return to their countries and they can't come to the United States because the borders closed there. And yes, some people are still crossing. Some people are still crossing the Rio Grande, which is extremely dangerous. Some people are still crossing in the desert, as we know from the recent apprehension of 30 migrants at the um, Bird Baylor No More Deaths Camp. We, yeah. we know they're crossing and frankly, our economy depends on them crossing because this country depends on slave labor, right? People who are willing to work for nothing because they have nothing. Um, so yeah, so a few people are still getting across, but it is, it is more dangerous than ever. And people who are seeking asylum, a couple may come who have very good grounds for asylum. Uh, for instance, we just had a, a dentist who was 
in detention for almost a year. Wow. He's from Cuba, a dentist. Used to be Cubans could just walk into this country and get asylum. And now they're being held. We have another man who was in detention for five years. He was a judge in Mexico uh. who proved that he had life-threatening uh, events oh. um, around. And judges just face that on a regular right. basis. So, but... so it's become a huge business to detain people in the U.S. That's a part of our economic package. And the dentist and the judge were detained in the United States? Yeah. And they were seeking Canada? asylum and they were seeking asylum. And that's not, you know, you're supposed to, the law, international law is you cross a border, you ask for asylum. If you pass a credible fear right. interview, then you're granted entry into the country, but they were not, they were immediately detained. Who benefits from that? Well, certainly the private uh, prison industry. Oh, uh, well, that's just one or two people. I mean, the dentist right. and the judge, but I mean, right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, it's amazing if you look at who's on the board and receiving profits from those private prisons. That's they quite the suspects, right? Yeah. Yeah. And some surprising ones. Yeah. And I just want to say one more thing about Valerie because yeah. all of us on this um, task force ministry team have been involved for a long time. And I knew Valerie back when I was executive director of Borderlinks and she was collecting migrant trash, the, you know, that was really baby bottles and backpacks and, and, and would make this altar. And so we would take delegations down to talk with Valerie so people could see the loss of life uh, as people begin to shed their stuff, you know, as they were crossing the border. And we hardly see any of that anymore because it's become so difficult to cross. So. Valerie, and it's your turn to talk, and I just wanted to say, um, th this the roots of this ministry team are, are really deep. Understood. Well, Valerie, go, you ready? Go ahead. Yes, as as Dell spoke, it still brings tears to my eyes. Uh, the <clears throat> that we lived on for almost a decade, uh, closer to the border, um, what we found. <laughs> Uh, literally would stumble across um, walking dogs uh, next to the ranch and um, not just the artifacts that people were forced to leave behind, but the people themselves. And so we would have guests who came to us and, and I often tell this story because I think that, that people in general across the country uh, have uh, grave misperceptions about what it's like to be on the border. But those of us who live here and who've lived here for a long time understand that there's this element that we like to think of as border culture. And in my neighborhood, which was on the outsides, outs, outskirts of a small town, um, we all took care of people who came to our doors. Even the most conservative ranchers had mercy. So it still brings tears to my eyes when I, when I remember, um, you know, and uh, I just uh, hope that we can continue to provide that kind of welcome for people. So. Now, um, we have a, a ministry of border arts ministry on the border, Artisans Beyond Borders, and it actually started last year. Um, as Bordando Esperanza, Embroidering Hope, which is what the mostly women in our group, the artisans in uh, Nogales, still refer to it as. Um, the roots of our program uh, are really came from working at Casa Alitas. Um, I'm the former volunteer arts and activities uh, coordinator uh, at our lead shelter here in Tucson, Casalitas. And um, the work that we did became more and more trauma-informed over time. One of the things that we noticed, in addition to working with the children, and um, we have collected over time, by the way, um, incredible artwork from the kids that came to us uh, that speak to the heart of these issues in a way that um, most of us can't even touch. I mean, it's very profound. Uh, and Casalitas is working right now to digitize that exhibit so that people- Oh, what a great idea. Yeah. yeah. It's really important, especially now. 
Can, can we put a link to that? Or it, it isn't completed yet, is it? But can it's you, in process. Will they, will they let us? Uh, oh, sure. Link to it, yeah. Sure. Can you make that happen? That's, that's great, yeah. yeah. And one of the things that we found over time also that was uh, particularly suited to mama care with adults, in particular women who had been abused, uh, and of course, uh, so many women and men who make this perilous journey have gone through situations that we can't even begin to understand. Uh, we can't even imagine or fathom what people have been through. Uh, one of the things that we found uh, was really helpful was simple work of the hands, um, embroidery, crochet. Um, these are, are the kinds of um, um, handwork that uh, are particularly suited to trauma. So we began to bring some of this down to Nogales. Um, we began at a small shelter last year and it grew and it, um, our project grew to serve, uh, God, upwards of a hundred families um, back last winter. Uh, and we were working in the streets with folks. And so we would uh, bring materials that were provided and donated by people across the country. Uh, we would bring cloth and thread and everything people needed so that they could make their own work. Um, it, it was really incredible. And um, this project that was grounded in healing and in respite began to provide real agency for people. Um, we were able to uh, find a way to, to purchase their work as soon as it was complete, as soon as it was finished. Um, and, um, and then people across the country would begin to, were, were able to, um, uh, to donate and uh, receive this beautiful work in the mail, which has become, over time, uh, that's become um, really incredible because of this virus. It's been very interesting. It's kind of a silver lining in a way. Um, we, uh, we were able to bring this material at first to Tucson, and now it's extended across the country. So it's really beautiful. And people are able to support um, women and children. This, the monies that they receive, the fair trade monies that they receive for their work, uh, goes to provide um, direct services, like, like for, for literally direct services. Transportation to take the bus across town, to the uh, Jesuit-run Comador, the Kino Border Initiative, so that they can get something to eat. Seriously, you know, you can't even uh, uh, travel with toddlers miles across town to be able to eat. Uh, diapers, uh, medicines, uh, it's just huge. And so um, this small, beautiful arts project has, has become... Uh, uh, really a mainstay for asylum seekers that are stuck right now, really stuck. They can't go forward. They can't go back. Um, the borders to their countries are closed uh, because of the virus. They're in really uh, difficult situation, totally displaced. Can I, can I ask you two questions? One, one is you're talking about people who are in Nogales, Sonora, who wish to uh, cross into the states and are waiting. Is that the population you mean? Yes. And yeah. then the the other question I had is, how did you spread the word across the country about their work and your activities and so on? How did that spread so far? Well, we have a, a website, Artisan Beyond Borders, um, and uh, this is a ministry of Grace St. Paul's. Uh, and you can check it out on the website, artisanbeyondborders.org. Um, totally nonprofit. We have a wonderful group of volunteers, and we're always um, open to um, more volunteers. So we have a group called the Friends of Artisans Beyond Borders. <laughs> and we're all volunteer, and we're, we are so excited to be able to have a way to help. I mean, this is a, a way, it's so grassroots. Um, a way to actually our hands to theirs to help. So we uh, have found creative workarounds to be able to get monies to them 
um, with the help of our Mexican partners uh, and then receive their work back. We bring it here to Tucson. We wash and we uh, all these beautiful pieces and hang them on the line and iron them and then send them out to people who donate uh -huh. to the project. Each and every penny goes right back to the project. And um, I'd like to hold up a couple of these beautiful pieces. Yeah, do it. See them. This one um, is yeah. particularly amazing. Uh, and I, I think that it says it all. The piece in us. Oh. Can you see? I don't know if we can see, yeah, but that's beautiful. Yes. And it's a bird cage, right? Yes, and there's a bird in the cage, and there's also a bird out. <laughs> the piece is inside us, right? Yes, the piece in us. Yeah. And most of the work, um, it's very beautiful because we just ask that the women and some men also who do this beautiful work do what they love. And so... Um, you know, we don't provide any direction at all. In fact, we learn from them. We just provide assistance and support. Um, and mostly the work that they do is based in the natural world. Um, all the things that they love and remember, um, uh, it brings um, such healing to go back to that place of nurture and family and home and land. and. Uh, we do have numerous beautiful devotional cloths mm -hmm. that people make as well. Oh my. God is love. These uh, beautiful mantas are, um, we get them and we just, they're so amazing. The work is so phenomenal. And, uh, you know, that we just we put them on the walls but they are used um, in the culture as servietas uh, they're used to wrap food to wrap pond to wrap bread tortillas uh, in lieu of plastics and i often say uh, that you know I, I feel like we can learn everything we need to know right now from indigenous people and so this is a piece of mexico and the country south uh, we have folks who are um, uh, from Nicaragua, from Venezuela, uh, from, of course, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Uh, and so this is a beautiful piece of home and family and culture, and they're sharing it with us. So it's really tremendous to be a part of. Well, you're making it possible for them to share it with us. Mm -hmm. And that's... that's uh... Grace St. Paul is making it possible. Well, Grace St. Paul and all our friends. And uh, <laughs> and you're the leader, Valerie. Uh, do not like it or not. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I want to I wanna just lift up. Valerie also was part of a project that created three women walking out of the desert, out of materials that they found in the desert. Isn't that right, Valerie? You were, and Debbie. Um, and uh, it was over on Pima... County Community College's east, southeast campus. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if, when you go there, you go by all of these airplanes that have been mothballed that were pointing south, like pointing towards Mexico, our enemy. Just astonishing all the planes, you know, ready in case we go to war. And then what? you go to the community college and you see these three women, indigenous women walking out of the tall grasses. And they were created to um, decay um, not as human bodies do, but but over the years they started to decay. But I, I think one of the great gifts about having Valerie on this team and in the world is she brings story to the statistics and human bodies and the things they wore. And, and I'm telling you, when people would go and see those three women, what were they called, Valerie? Las Madres. It's the... Right. It's Others of women and men who uh, who have been left behind, and each one of these three figures, would, which exist to this day, they were put up in 2005 by an artist collective. It was a group of us: mm -hmm. um, uh, Antonio Gallegos, uh, Cesar, um, Deb, of course, uh, and uh, 
we made this work out of the material that we found left behind. So a uh, burlap, khaki, denim, and um, they, they really profoundly have, have begun to um, decompensate in the elements, um, you know, the severe elements of our desert. Um, and they'll stand to this day, it's just extraordinary. But each one of the women uh, represents a thousand people who have been lost in the desert. Who've died, whose lives have been lost. Yeah, yeah. in the desert. So it's, um, it's uh, I guess, our original um, memorial, mm -hmm. um, all of those who've been lost in our area. So uh, do you all have any discussion of what we individuals can and as a group should be thinking about should be doing day to day to support these efforts uh, to find information which and I hope we can post uh, a lot of the, the, the names of organizations and so on that you all mentioned uh, uh, but um, talk a little bit about what the ordinary GS peer <laughs> might, you, uh, might be thinking about. Then you talk about letter writing? Yes. Um, yes. I, the stories that Dell uh, described uh, that Valerie is, is, is uh, creating, I read those stories from men and women in detention. Uh, I've visited for five years and now I mostly correspond with them. And you too can correspond. Some of them write in English or you may know uh, enough Spanish. Uh, and even if you don't know Spanish, there's birthday cards to send on their birthdays. And so that is a very real way to give hope to an individual who's incarcerated maybe for years. Margie, how do you get in touch with those people personally? Well, there's an organization in town that I'm a part of. Ah called a Casa Mariposa Visitation Program. Uh -huh. And they've been visiting since 2012. Uh, they are not now because of COVID. Uh, but uh, I think, Harlan, we should put a lot of different links on the GSP website. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna need now, some I, help with that, but uh, let's make I, it so. I like to also uh, donate to legal organizations that are help that are challenging on an individual and a group level. I noticed the ACLU and some affiliate, like the Florence Project, are trying to get a huge number of people out during the age of COVID. Remembering that these people are nonviolent. They're not criminal. <laughs> they could wear ankle bracelets at their family's home in New York or wherever they were intending to go. So that's something else to do. There's, uh, Grace St. Paul has given some money, and we always need more, for a group of Central Americans living in Tucson who do not receive any uh, uh, of the, the, the checks or the unemployment that, that a citizen would receive during this time period. I realize that has run out now temporarily, we hope but they have never received anything. So we have contributed boxes of food for this population. There's about 35 families. So I can put that on the website as well. Yeah, um, I think I'm just gonna throw out some, some organizations and we can write them down later, but No More Deaths, The Florence mm -hmm. Project, The Samaritans, um, Casa Litas, um, Casa Mariposa, um, Keep Tucson Together. There are many organizations working now to get people out of detention who are as asylum seekers um, because of the COVID situation, but also they've just been in detention for so darn long. Um, and, and this letter writing thing, there, there's a new group of people that are writing to prisoners, detainees in La Palma, mm -hmm. which is another big um, detention facility. And one of the benefits of that, I mean, in addition to writing back and forth and just developing lovely relationships with people, um, important life-giving relationships, a person just got out of de uh, detention last week who had gotten asylum 
the dentist that I was telling you about from Cuba. And he said, when that letter came, it was like, it was like Easter and Christmas and birthday all wrapped together. Just yeah. so, yeah. so, so life-giving. And when this man got out, Enrique's his name, the person who had been writing to him went and picked him up at the bus station. Cause that's what they do. They go and drop him off at the bus station as if they could, somehow or other get a bus yeah. ticket and get to where they're going there's a woman in phoenix who on her own goes to the bus station and picks people up takes them to dinner first takes them to her home and then kind of parses them out to the community but anyway this this fellow who'd been writing to enrique um picked him up at the bus station where she she met him brought him home we all got to meet him and to support him he was waiting for his husband to be released who was supposed to be released a week later because the law is if, if, if a spouse is released then the, the spousal partner should be released too. He got a bad judge and wasn't released. So the community support, but the knitting together of a new world through those kinds of relationships as people come out is really, really a remarkable thing and something I think people have been waiting for. The other thing is Casa Lidas still has volunteer opportunities available, very few, but that's a um, it was um, a, a, a center for sh a shelter for asylum seekers. Now it's mainly for people coming out who have had advocates from Keep T T Tucson Together and the Florence Project uh, who have gotten people out of detention. And like I said, one of them had been in detention for five years. I mean, you can imagine the level of trauma. We have a Russian woman who's waiting for her husband, her son to be released and she's been there for nine months. Um, um, a transgender Guatemalan woman who uh, was there for two years. Um, and so it's more of a longer term situation now. But I, I volunteered yesterday and, and, and took the Russian woman to Costco and she's cooking and we just had a ball. So there's all <laughs> kinds of things to do. There's not a place where we can take stuff anymore. And that's one way people really yeah. appreciated being able to help. But Casa Litas and those organizations still need donations and they do need volunteers. I mean, this is a little bit off the subject, I guess, but a Russian woman was uh, caught trying to uh, cross from Mexico. Is that what happened to her? Caught. These are all people who have turned themselves in to seek oh. asylum, right? So, oh. so she was not apprehended walking in illegally. She oh. came across the port of entry. We've had we've had a great deal of Russians. We've had uh, Ukrainians. We've had. Haitians, we've had uh, from different countries in Africa, Ecuador, Brazil. But we're not uh, talking about only people who have been apprehended trying to cross the border. Uh, Casa Lidas does not have people who've been apprehended who've tried to cross oh, the border. Oh, I see. Oh. No, Casa Lidas only has people who have crossed and asked for asylum, which they're not giving anymore. They're putting people in detention right away instead of granting <laughs> asylum. Yeah. But a few of them, their cases are so dire. Um, for instance, one of the ones that was picked up the other day at that raid of 30 people had blisters on his feet that were so deep they went to the bone. And he had rhabdo, my something, whatever it is, where the muscles start to melt and it, it eventually kills us from um, thirst. Um, and so we, we got him and he's going to be put into the chute for asylum seekers. But um, we, we've never gotten people who've crossed illegally and who find their way to that shelter. It's always been I people see. who are in the legal process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and they're not the bulk of the uh, people with issues. Right. I mean, mostly they're Spanish speakers from South. You mean the people, that, the asylum seekers? Yeah. They're not mostly Spanish speakers. No? Not anymore. No. Oh. No. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, there would be a day that we'd get half Brazilian. Well, they, that that's uh, Portuguese, but half Brazilian. Well, all right, but from the south. Or, uh, or or Indian, we'd get a half half a group, twenty people from India, and twenty people <laughs> from Latin America. Yeah, it was it was really interesting trying to figure no that out. Wow, I don't know what the attraction is to coming to the states these days, but uh, it's not it's not an attraction. It's a it's an inability to sustain life where they are. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I think that's uh, about it for now, unless uh, anybody wants to say something else. We're... I'll say thank you, Harlan, for giving yeah. us this forum. Yeah. Uh, and again, however, anybody who's listening to this, however you want to help, 
you can always call me. I think my number's available. Um, and email me, uh, email the church, call the church. There's some way you can get in touch with us. We'd love to see you. And also, I'd like to say for those of us who are sheltering in place, unable to help in a direct way at the border, you can always donate funds. Donate funds, for instance, to Artisans Beyond. Oh my God, hold that one up a little higher. That we didn't see. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Wow, that's nice. In 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 receiving one of these, we're receiving a whole person's world. Yeah. Um, many of these are like retablos. They're like beautiful religious devotional uh, works, um, and we are uh, we are just so fortunate that they're sharing them with us. And so um, we can help, and, and our monies go to direct services to literally help people directly in the moment right now. So um, I'm just so I'm so happy that GSP is um, has partnered up with all of our Mexican partners as well. Voices from the border, um, uh, our shelters across the line, we're all working in whatever way we can together right now because. It's working as a team that's really going to make it work day to day for people in the worst of circumstances. So. And I think I have it right. Can I just say most one, most one of the workers are, are volunteers, or all of the yeah. workers yeah. are volunteers. Is that not right? Uh, go ahead, Bill. Sorry. As a as a retired pastor, um, this immigration team is amazing. I mean, it is a dream team that a church has that many people who are really engaged. And so often there's a ministry team, social justice ministry team, where there's one person that's the engine of the group. And we have 10 engines, you know? <laughs> and it makes a difference in the world. So I'm, I'm so pleased to see that this is a very rare situation to have such a committed group and the church leadership, um, Steve, um, uh, Father Steve, really committed to making sure that this work um, continues. That's just great. Well, I think we'll end it there and thank you all very much. We'll get this up as soon as we can. And um, great, thank you, Harlan. So really long for now, thank you all very much. This was good. Yes, a big, big- Bye Valerie, Margie. Yes, so long. Bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs>